Um, so I'm, I'm aware I've been I've been talking for a rather long time, haven't I? I, I you may not find it too surprising to know that uh, uh, arthropods are the group that I I really work on. Um, OK, so um, crustaceans then, crustaceans sometimes called the insects of the sea. They're the dominant arthropods uh, in, in the sea. Um, some, however, have become um, partly or completely terrestrial, so coconut crabs uh, and woodlice. Woodlice are now um, terrestrial. There are also terrestrial um, amphipods um, as well. Um, copepods are um, incredibly numerous within the sea. In fact, um, whales, baleen whales, um, eat a couple of groups of um, crustaceans uh, as a large fraction of their diet. One is copepods and the other is krill. Both are, are um, crustacean groups. About 40,000 species described. The head, as we've already seen, is made up of these five segments um, and they have two pairs of antennae, mandibles, and then two pairs of maxillae. And often there's appendages from the trunk incorporated into the feeding apparatus. I'm going to, there are many groups of crustaceans. I'm going to keep the classification relatively simple. I'm going to talk about three groups very quickly. Um, and some of the representatives of these groups will be familiar. The branchiopods, which include things like water fleas. The maxillopods that include the copepods I've just mentioned, but also things like barnacles. And the malacostricans that include, well, most of the ones that are nice to eat. Um, I have eaten barnacles, don't recommend it. Um, but um, so uh, malacostricans are things like lobsters, shrimps, um, uh, but also woodlice. I've eaten woodlice as well, don't particularly re recommend those. So the branchiopods then, starting off, uh, these are generally reckoned to be a, a primitive group and they have great plasticity in their form. So something like a water flea has very few legs, something like Artemia, a fairy shrimp, has lots of legs. And uh, they are, uh, many of these groups are um, very numerous, fresh water as well. The maxillopods then, the second group, these are the copepods that I said were um, part of um, baleen whale ducts. And they're also the cirripedes, the so-called feathery legs, uh, barnacles, um, there are also a number of parasitic groups like the branchiura and the ostracods. Um, fantastic fossil record of ostracods, uh, if anyone's interested. And then the thing you will be interested in is the ones that are nice to eat, uh, like, for example, lobsters, crabs. Uh, this is krill. These are krill making up huge shoals that are, again, scooped up by baleen whales. Uh, but of course, all the prawns and shrimps. This is a deep sea isopod that's actually a, um, a relative of the woodlice that's now terrestrial. And there's a woodlouse, just in case you didn't know what a, a woodlouse looked like. This is um, a stomatopod malacostrican, a, a so-called um, uh, mantis shrimp, because the, 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 the forelimbs of the trunk uh, look very similar to the, um, the praying limbs of a praying mantis. Uh, and there's an urban legend that these things have such a, an amazingly powerful chop with these um, with these forelimbs that they can break their way out of their aquaria. I don't believe that's true, but they're certainly able to um, catch prey and, and stun prey and kill prey uh, with their with their forelimbs. Uh, an amazing ability. They also have uh, incredible eyes with a band of very, very closely packed um, uh, facets that they scan across things they're trying to judge the shape and distance of. Um, and this is a very large spider crab. Um, so it's a decapod uh, crustacean, enormous, I think it's the largest of the crustacea um, uh, and um, rather magnificent it is too. Um, so very important uh, constituents of plankton then are crustaceans, the copepods and uh, euphorsiacea or krill I've already mentioned. Um, but the larvae of many large crustacea, things like the lobsters and shrimps and so forth, are also planktonic and so they also make up a big uh, component of the zooplankton. Uh, and so that's crustaceans. Now remember, hexapods, including the insects, 
um, are just one specialised group of crustacea, really, um, and they have uh, uh, become the most diverse of all um, animal groups. About um, Well, here it says a million and a half described um, species. They tend to be terrestrial. Some have gone back uh, to being freshwater. Uh, the body, as I'm sure you know, has these three tagmata. The head, the thorax with three pairs of walking legs and often uh, a couple of pairs of wings, and the abdomen. And in the head, they've got antennae. They then miss a pair of antennae that are present in crustacea, so they've lost a pair. The mandibles and two pairs of maxillae, again, this five-segment head. And like the myriapods, they've evolved a system for gas exchange because they're now living on the land. They've done away with gills and they have a tracheal system, these branching tubes that um, uh, are used for gas exchange. So uh, no matter how bizarre um, insects look, they stick to this head, thorax, abdomen, three pairs of walking limbs design. So this is a mantis. You can see that the forelimbs are modified for catching prey, but they're still walking on them. So uh, even though the, the, um, the different segments of the thorax, this one's become very elongated. It's a very odd shape insect, but it's still sticking to this rigid division of the body in this way. And crustaceans, you may remember, were much more flexible about this. Um, so this is a, a, a typical um, insect. It's a cockroach. Uh, you can see head, thorax, abdomen, three pairs of walking legs. This is just to show you the dorsal heart um, and the ventral, uh, the double ventral nerve cord. You can't see, um, but uh, oh no, yes you can. There it goes. There it's in in, um, in brown there, uh, with these ganglia in each um, segment. Um, the gut is complete, of course, runs through to the anus, um, fore, mid and hind gut. Um, there are also very commonly these structures called mid gut, seeky or these diverticuli that may contain bacteria that help the animal to digest, for example, cellulose and other things. And uh, further back in the gut, there are these um, little snaky things called malpighian tubules that snake around within the hemocele. Uh, within the hemolymph and they are important for excretion and then the back end of the guts more doing the job of trying to recover water before things are voided in the frass or the poo um, and typically two pairs of wings uh, both deriving from um, the, um, the the thorax and these are new structures in evolutionary terms so if you think about what happens in birds they've had to sacrifice their forelimbs to make wings whereas insects these are de novo structures they're, they're newly evolved structures and um, possibly um, from the epipodites possibly from something called paranotal lobes but the bottom line is they've still got walking legs on those segments that bear the wings so they haven't had to do away with the walking legs to evolve the wings um, very quickly, I'm not going to, one could spend, and indeed we used to have whole units that looked at uh, entomology, the evolution of insects, the economic importance of insects, and so on. So I'm, I'm really going to just mention very quickly uh, something about the, the different groups of insects. Well, not really anything at all. So there are, um, there are wingless insects, the so-called A Pteri goats. Pteri, um, ptera means wing as in pteranodon, flying uh, relative to the dinosaurs. But pterot means wings. A pterigoat means no wings. So these are things like um, columbolans, springtails, silverfish, fire bats, and so forth. Uh, and these have never had wings. It's not that they've lost them. These are insects before the evolution of wings. We still have some of those around today. And then there are the pterygotes, the winged insects. Uh, and these we can divide in two. The hemimetabola, these are ones that undergo some sort of change as they molt from juveniles to adults. Um, but it's incomplete metamorphosis. They change a bit, but they don't change completely. And the holometabola, the, the ones that undergo complete metamorphosis. Uh, typically they'll go through a, a, a caterpillar or maggot stage, they'll then pupate and then emerge as the adult 
uh, and then they tend not to molt after that. Um, so the A pterygotes are uh, wingless, the winged pterygotes, and I've already said all that. Um, so quickly then, let's have a look at um, a hollow metabolus or endoterragote insect. The two terms, hollow metabola and endoterragote, mean the same thing. Um, so let's take something like a butterfly. You know that the egg hatches out into a little tiny caterpillar and that caterpillar has an extensible cuticle. It grows, it feeds like mad, of course, and it grows as far as it can. And then the cuticle, it's a bit like blowing up a balloon. It can't extend any more. And then it has to molt and then it's able to grow again. So it grows, it, it, it grows quite rapidly and then the cuticle starts to slow its rate of growth and then it has to molt. So it sort of grows in these sort of um, mounds, if you like. Uh, then it gets to a point where it's eaten as much as it can and it then pupates. The body is completely re reorganised in an incredible process uh, which probably deserves its own unit or own lecture course um, to understand and then the adult the winged adult uh, emerges and often these don't um, these don't live so very long um, again in a beetle again the the the, the larva or the grub uh, again eats away pupates and then changes into the adult the sexually reproductive um, adult uh, and this is manduca the tobacco hornworm it's a lovely example of a caterpillar that, that grows pretty huge and then um, pupates and metamorphoses into the adult um, uh, moth so that's the hollow metabola or the endoterragota on the other hand are the hemimetabola or the exo Pterygota. These, although they change as they uh, mature, they don't undergo pupation. Uh, the last instar, uh, sometimes the last two, are where the wings appear. Um, but these are cockroaches, so they start off like little cockroaches and they gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger, damn them. Uh, and then the last molt produces the wings. Cockroaches rarely fly, not because they can't, I think because they just can't be bothered. Um, and this is a this is a locust sort of going through these um, hopper stages and gradually maturing to the adult. Um, if we look at arthropod diversity, as I've said, most arthropods are insects, the vast majority and the vast majority of insects are beetles. And that doesn't leave much space within invert within uh, uh, in invertebrates and indeed vertebrates for all the other species so that's why although I've rambled a bit that's why um, arthropods deserve <coughs> a disproportionate amount of our, our time oh it's an animated slide that's a bad idea so insects hugely successful the lineages are long-lived geologically and it seems that uh, a design of insects will evolve and they will design as in you know, ground plan and they will persist for an enormous amount of geological time. Huge diversity in terms of species richness. Lots and lots of individuals within each species. Consider how many ants there are or aphids. Um, geographically widespread and ecologically hugely diverse. Another animated slide. Um, another reason for their success Tagmosis, we've already mentioned, the ability to specialise limbs for different functions. The fact that they can fly, the evolution of flight in insects has helped them to disperse, help them to um, uh, exploit different niches. Amazingly complex sense organs. Um, uh, and uh, the ability to metamorphose means that they can exploit different niches during their lifespan. So consider something like a, a dragonfly. It spends most of its life uh, as an aquatic limp, nymph living within uh, a pond or maybe a slow moving river. And it's a predatory um, water living um, animal that has gills and it's able to, to, to um, uh, feed and grow in that way. And then towards the end of its life, it crawls up a reed and it metamorphoses into an adult dragonfly uh, and does something completely different and reproduces sexually. So that that ability to exploit different niches within even within the 
the lifetime of a single individual uh, is uh, uh, very important. And also that the eggs have this tough, very resistant egg shell. Lots and lots of parasitic insects. No, no surprise to learn, as anyone who's ever had a cat will know. Uh, they're able to exploit very small um, living spaces, of course. One of the questions, why the, look at any science fiction film, uh, well, not any science, but so many science fiction films exploit the idea of huge insects, particularly back in the 50s and so on. Um, insects, of course, look so otherworldly, so alien. Many alien designs are modelled on arthropods because of their very different um, biology. Um, but why are there no massive, hugely enormous uh, uh, insects? What limits their size? Um, the, one of the biggest uh, insects uh, that we know of, Meganeura, um, from the Carboniferous, was a giant dragonfly, wingspan, well, we think pushing up towards a metre, certainly 70, 80 centimetres um, plus. And part of the reason for attaining those larger sizes was a higher partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere back then, but that doesn't quite explain what was going on. So one of the limiting things is the ability of this tracheal system to distribute oxygen to the tissue, so uh, the internal tissues. So they rely, insects rely to a great extent on diffusion. They're able to pulsate the abdomen, to pulsate the body, and of course this helps to draw gases in and out, but they don't have anything like a lung. So as these tubes branch finer and finer, diffusion becomes more and more important. And again, if you dissect an insect, you can see these silvery looking tubes, and those are the increasingly finely branching tracheae, and these go all the way up to the surface where they um, open out in these spiracles uh, to the outer um, surface. So diffusive um, process is very important. And people have looked at closely related um, species of beetle. So this particular study from a few years ago in PNAS, these are all um, closely related species but getting bigger. So there are big species and small species. And if you compare the tracheal systems in these different species, the big beetles have more and more and more of their body volume given over to um, trachea. And this is because as you get bigger, particularly if you stay the same form, your mass goes up with a cube, your surface area goes up with a square. And so you've got proportionally more tissue to feed with oxygen. Uh, so at some point you're having to give over huge amounts of your uh, internal anatomy to trachea. Another limiting point, another crunch point, is the, the joints into the legs. So the muscles of the legs have to be fed with, um, with trachea and those get bigger and bigger and bigger. The, the tubes you need to run into the legs as your size increases and that's a, you have to change your form uh, in order to, to, to do that. Or you have to start to try to devise some mechanism for pumping air in and out of your body. Um, so huge insects in the Carboniferous uh, and one uh, possible explanation for that is that the higher partial pressure of oxygen. Um, if we look at the, the, the size distribution of uh, insects, uh, these are uh, numbers of species up the side, this is insect length as an adult, we can see that um, the, the most common size, I think this is this is across beetles, I think in this case, but the most common size is close to the smallest. Uh, and very large insects are increasingly rare. And this is not an, unnorm, an unusual pattern of size distribution to see in any group of animals. Um, so what are the biggest insects today? Um, well, it depends how you define big. Um, one idea would be the biggest wingspan, so there are certainly uh, many damselflies that have impressive wingspans, 20 centimetres or more. Um, bird wing butterflies going up uh, towards 30 centimetres. Heaviest, possibly the goliath beetle. Largest in terms of body length, well that could be the, the um, uh, uh, the Titanus giganteus, or indeed the, the giant uh, stick insect, they have 30 centimetre long uh, bodies, but 
very thin, so that looks a little bit less impressive. Um, so this is the, um, the, the Titan beetle, Titanus giganteus. All of the children holding these look rather sinister for some reason, I don't entirely understand. Um, that's the, the Hercules beetle, which I think is longer, but a lot of the length is given over to this big pronotum here, sticking out the front end. Um, uh, this is the giant walking stick insect, Again, impressive length, but quite thin looking, so it's a bit less intimidating. My my personal favourite, the giant spiny stick insect. This thing's really got attitude. Um, rather impressive. Um, uh, giant mantis, also quite impressive. Uh, the New Zealand wetter, that wins on sort of robustness, I guess. Um, uh, and my personal absolute favourite, this is the devil's head flower mantis. They're just the most um, incredible uh, looking, rather sinister looking uh, animal. Again, this this is still an insect. It's still got three pairs of walking legs, a head, a thorax and abdomen, despite this amazing um, form. And there are some of the largest dragonflies and, and the, the largest wingspan of a damselfly. And that's it.